Andrew, you are muted. Uh, sorry. Uh, thanks a lot, Chief, for the nice introduction. And thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but uh, um, nowadays it's, it gets more difficult to travel somehow. But I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about um, this trustworthy AI for medical imaging. And um, I hope you can see the screen clearly. So I find this topic to be kind of an ambiguous thing because there's not really a, a great definition for it. And everyone has different um, adjectives that they use to describe it. And um, I, I, I often focus on these four different adjectives. So um, robust, interpretable, sensitive. And there's this other one that I don't think I found a very good uh, notion into English. But it looks like in Chinese, there is a direct word for it. And I'm not going to try to pronounce this because it would go completely against um, this notion. But it's about you know, self knowing your limitations and not making all things. And so the robustness is basically being adaptable and um, being still being able to work, even the input changes. Um, interpretable is, I guess, we all know it's basically trying to figure out or trying to tell to the user or interact with the user how the model is predicting. And this, um, the other part is basically not um, predicting in cases where the model is not trained for. And I think the best example is given in this image here. If you're going to do something with brain MRI and if you have an image that's um, completely scarred with motion artifacts, the model should be able to tell that it's not gonna be able to do much. And the last adjective that I, I often think about is the sensitivity. So can we actually create models that can really operate at uh, useful points? And I want to like, um, delve into this robustness and the sensitive model and um, basically try to give you how I see the field, what we've done, and what is still missing in my opinion. So we can start with the first one. And the question that we've been asking for ourselves um, for the last maybe four or five years is, can we actually get truly robust models? Um, by that, what I mean is, is it's probably most easily explained by image segmentation. Um, I think most people kind of see this as, as a rather solved problem for most anatomical structures. And um, it is true that for most anatomical structures, you can actually train a really good deep learning model. And the accuracies are very close to integrated variability. Now, this is a phrase that often um, is thrown out. And we wanted to do the, do the test for prostate segmentation with a clinical collaborator, and we took six different readers and you know did 80 um, images, segmented it six times and then compared them. It was really the case that, for example, prostate segmentation, segmentation deep learning models produce a dice score about 0.8 and the integrated variable we found was 0.74. So it looks like this is solved um, unless you want to now start applying this model outside. Um, you really ship this model, you know, you've trained very well, you had a database of images, you had the labels, you've got really good models, and you do um, all the validation you can and you get good scores. And then you get these images that change either slightly, which is maybe the more realistic case, or change abruptly, which is less realistic, but it's kind of an interesting point scientifically. And then you notice that your model fails. So it's not acting properly, it's not predicting well, um, things are not consistent, and the clinicians seems to complain according to this 2020 um, survey by um, Academy of American Radiology. Um, so even the slight differences cause problems. Uh, so your training and test data either has to be the same or you have to make sure that your algorithm kind of can adapt to these changes or can take that into account during training. Now this problem is obviously not um, only for segmentation. Um, I'm sure some of the people in the audience have know this paper by heart. So this is this uh, big splash paper that was published in Nature about um, the breast cancer prediction. And in these plots, what kind of like, is, is quite interesting to me is that they have this really amazing ROC curve for the, um, for the population in UK. And then they solve a slightly different problem in the US and they have another ROC curve. So direct comparison of these um, like solid lines is difficult, but they put this dashed line here, which is the output of the system um, that was trained only using UK data. And it's kind of surprising that there is a big gap between these two lines. So it's actually, um, I'm not sure if the populations differ too much between the UK and the US, 
but it looks like um, things are different. And even that change kind of causes a substantial drop in the accuracy. So this, this, this is not only segmentation, this is general deep learning models. So Ben's group um, two years ago published this nice paper that, that they actually really named things. Uh, these changes might happen due to different reasons like population shift, annotation shift, and so on. Um, what we'll be focusing on so far is this acquisition shift. Um, so that's kind of rather physics-based and in theory, it should be solvable. So that's what we wanted to focus on for the meantime. And we figured out that actually even that's not that trivial. So in the literature, there's really quite a number of ways to deal with it. This problem is well known. If you're in the area, um, there's really a lot of effort that went to it. The, the most straightforward one, and I tried to summarize them in this table, and the most straightforward one is you basically train a different model for each domain. So you have a training set, you have training labels, you train it in the source domain, you train it in the target domain, and you have two different really good models. That's kind of the best you can do, but it's also the, 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 the most costly one. And then you can actually start reducing the amount of data or amount of labels required at the target domain, either by using transfer learning, for instance, using unsupervised domain adaptation, where you still need data from the target domain, but you don't really need labels. Or you can start saying that, you know what, actually, my models should be trained to take into account different changes. So actually, we should create these domain generalization tools. And she had a really nice article in this domain, the domain generalization using meta learning. And um, you can actually also think of once you do this domain generalization at the training time, you can adapt the model in the test time as well. And on the, on the, on the, on the other extreme, which is um, less considered nowadays somehow is this unsupervised segmentation. So what um, people in brain imaging have been doing for a um, yeah, couple of decades which is basically say that let's build probabilistic models, let's have an atlas and just try to solve one unsupervised segmentation clustering problem um, supervised by an atlas at the output of the target domain only. But that has some limited applications. It doesn't really work if the, if the anatomy changes too much. So from my point of view, and this might change with everyone, but from my point of view for medical imaging, what makes sense is this domain generalization. Because then I can create a model and I can ship it and the model will, hopefully work in the target domains without requiring too much effort. And this can be done in the training strategy or in the inference time strategy. Now, there has been quite, as I said, a number of articles for training strategy already. And these methods actually do quite well. So what we've done is we've done um, analysis on four different or three different anatomies, so brain, prostate, and heart. And we have the source domain images and the target domains. For the brain, we have two target domains. For the prostate, we had three target domains, but they had different type of annotations. And for the heart, we had one. Now, if you actually train a model with a source domain and apply it in the target domain, your dice scores decrease. What I'm showing you is basically a dice scores that is computed over a whole dot validation set. So this is a dice score you get in the source domain. So let me try to change this actually. This is a dice score you get in the source domain. And if you apply this model on the target domain, the dice score decreases. If the target domain changes a lot, for example, if the source domain is T1 and the target domain is T2, the drop is even higher. And on the second row, I show you what you could get if you actually were to train a neural network on the target domain. So, you know, targets, target domain specific networks, the benchmark models. And you see there is a huge drop between the source domain application and target domain training. Now, the nice thing is, is training time strategies for domain generalization work quite well. You see that actually 58 rises to 75 in one case, if you're actually moving from one source domain to one target domain for the brain. For the prostate, again, 58 rises to 77 almost, and the heart, you see a similar picture. So 67 rises up to 74. That's actually quite promising. So we started to wonder, okay, so the, these domain generalizations work very well, but there seems to be still a gap. Um, and the question is, can we actually borrow some ideas from these unsupervised um, segmentation problems and try to complement these models with a test time adaptation module? And we've worked on this and uh, we've published this paper and I want to discuss a little bit what we've done there. 
um, that actually try to complement a really well-trained model, you know, using all the tricks and hacks you have for the domain generalization you're training on, and then complement it with a test time adaptation. So you kind of adapt your model for each test image. Now the conventional way of training model goes like this, right? You have all the training images that you have, for example, they might come from multiple domains and you train them. So if you have one and if you apply it on the same domain, you get good results. If the image characteristics change, you start having um, well, less accurate results. In this new way, instead, we actually divide the network into two parts. So that basically means that you have two sets of parameters in the network here, the theta and the phi. And pictorial, the network looks something like this. You have the first part that actually aims to normalize image intensities. And the second part aims to predict segmentations based on the normalized intensities. Now, the trick here is effectively at the training time, they're not much different. The conventional way of test time adaptive networks are the same thing. Where they differ is the test time. So you actually have a test time adaptation optimization that's happening, which tries to optimize the parameters of this normalization module such that you get better segmentation results. So when you apply it at test time, you start adapting these network parameters. So you have a new normalization module that is defined per image. Effectively, what you can do is you can actually take a T2 image, for instance, and really normalize it to the same space as with a T1 weighted image and get the segmentation. Now, the trick here is to be able to do it, obviously, in an unsupervised way, because if you were to do it supervised way, obviously, this is possible, but can you do it in an unsupervised way. And our initial idea was, hey, let's use an old trick, shape priors, but then, you know, do it with new tools so that they're more generalizable. And one new tool is the denoising autoencoder that simply takes into account the noisy prediction and spits out the denoise prediction. So it takes a noisy segmentation, perhaps output of an inaccurate model and maps it to a closest um, nice segmentation that might actually lighten the shape prior. So you basically have your prediction, for example, with the unoptimized or unnormalized image. And then you basically optimize for a dice loss between that prediction and the output of the denoising autoencoder for that prediction. And the assumption here is if your model is doing well, then, or if your denoising autoencoder is trained well, then if the input is a clean segmentation, the output will not change. So when this noisy prediction is not noisy anymore, it is satisfactory, the discrepancy between the prediction and the output of the denoising autoencoder will go to zero. So pictorially, what it looks like is something like this. We have a cardiac image and we have a segmentation problem. We have the image and the intensities are being normalized. We have the predicted labels coming out of the neural network. And then we have the output of the denoised auto, denoising autoencoder. And then I'm basically scrolling through the steps. And what you see here is in the start, you have a big discrepancy. As the optimization is running at test time, the discrepancy is getting lost. And effectively, the segmentation is also increasing nicely. And the nice thing with this is you can actually apply the same methodology on multiple anatomies and you have the same structure. So the image intensities gets normalized so that the discrepancy between the input and the output of the denoise and autoencoder are reduced. Um, so this was nice. And then we applied it and we did the analysis over these domain generalization methods. And it looked like, hey, you can actually really improve those segmentation results further. We started with these um, really strong baseline, the domain, um, somehow this data augmentation scheme that used these deep stacked autoencoders that was, I think, published um, from an author at NIH. And we could actually increase the accuracies quite a bit. So for closed domains, you can go from 75 to 80. That's great. For far away domains, you can go from you know, 0 0.08, so quite a bad segmentation, to a decent segmentation result. And the same thing basically happened for all the anatomies that we looked at. Fine. But then what we notice is there is still a gap. We're still not at 0.9, for example, for the target domain um, for the brain imaging. And, and, and the fact is we should be able to get there because this target domain is also a T1 weighted image, similar to a source domain. So there's no reason why we're not there. During exactly at the same time, actually a couple of groups did the same thing. So this is, I think the, the paper entropy minimization from Trevor Darrell's group in Berkeley. Uh, this is our paper. This is Jerry Prince's group. Um, then there's somebody using autoencoders. And this is a group of Schulkopf basically published a year later. So once these papers came out, we said, okay, let's do another study. And I have to say that we tried to create another algorithm to beat everyone. <laughs> 
but then it didn't really happen because it turned out to be a much difficult problem. But what we noticed is something interesting. So most of these um, um, test time adaptation methods, so you minimize the entropy of the, at the predictions, you do the denosing autoencoder trip I just explained, you have an autoencoder in the feature layers, or you basically kind of minimize second order statistics over the activations. You can actually close kind of the gap between um, the baseline and the um, transfer learning or the benchmark quite a bit for the normal anatomies. And I know there's a lot of um, numbers here. Actually, what I want you to focus on is this very last column, which is super striking. Like this is segmentation of white matter hyperintensities. This is a segmentation problem that um, SPL or free surfer does okay. We basically train a neural network. And then when we apply it, you know, um, the baseline model, the segmentation is super bad. We're just unable to segment anything. Now with data augmentation, you get slightly better segmentation, 0.37. And all of the this test time adaptation or domain generalization methods did not improve anything. And the critical point here is that the benchmark is 0.8 almost. So um, I think the next frontier for this domain generalization is actually not anatomical segmentation, but segmentation of, of lesions, which turned out to be quite a difficult problem. So with that, I want to go to the second point, and I want to actually talk about whether we can work, make our models work at realistic operating points. Um, so what I, what I mean by this is something like this. Um, a, a year ago, we started working on this problem um, to improve the workflow for prostate MR. Now in Switzerland and in many other countries, if there's a suspicion of prostate cancer, patients go through a multiparametric MRI first before a biopsy. And the multiparametric MRI includes the normal structural and diffusion imaging, but it also includes a dynamic contrast enhanced image, which is costly, not very pleasant for the patient. So it, it would be great if that can actually be avoided. And it looks like for a majority of the patients, the radiologists don't really need it to say that, okay, there is cancer for sure, or there is no cancer. So the problem we want to solve is, can we actually build an algorithm to do that? Basically say that for this patient, you need a DCE, for this patient, you don't. Now, this is a usual ROC curve. No? You have the specificity and the sensitivity here, and this is complete over the validation set. Now, when you look at the ROC curve, for this and similar problems, you actually want to be there. No? These are your operating points. You don't want to miss patients who truly need a DCE for a correct diagnosis. Now, the issue there is the false positives is huge. The model is sensitive, sure, but it's not really specific. It's not actually a useful model in the end. And actually evaluating this model at a point like this is not that useful. Now, what we want is we really want to push these points further to the left. So keep the sensitivity, reduce the false positive rate. And these are the realistic operating points for most of the applications involving medical imaging. And it is a tough problem. Right? So you have small sample sizes. You have large dimensional input for each sample. In this case, we have four volumetric images. There is a heavy class imbalance. And the critical class that you don't want to miss is almost always a minority class. And this kind of applies to many problems in medicine. I want to um, uh, give a shout out to these people who published this really, really nice work in JAMA Cardiology in 2019, I believe. And um, this is one of the very rare work that actually evaluated their model and two operating points. So they had a, you know, a normal equal sensitivity, equal specificity operating point where they achieved really good sensitivity and specificity, you know, 80% for both. But then they had a realistic point where they wanted to make sure that the sensitivity is at 90%. And you know, they wanted to basically screen for hyperkalemia from ECG, uh, um, echocardiogram. So these are the type of problems that you don't want to miss these patients. And let's focus on these two columns here. In the normal role of how we train models, the sensitivity and the specificity are nice, no? 80%, 80%. But when I increase the sensitivity to 90%, the drop in the specificity is huge. Now, this was a model that they predicted, uh, they wanted to predict with two leads in an ECG. And a similar story happens if you use four leads. So 80%, 85% sensitivity specificity in that you know, normal, let's report our results machine learning type of way. But if you look at the real operating point at 90% sensitivity, their specificity drops to 70%. Now, 
They actually did a wonderful job in evaluating their model in three different centers, and the result is always the same. You have 78, 75, that drops to 55% of specificity. So we can say that the current strategy of how we train models is not working. Oh, so we were kind of curious whether we can make this better. So we published this paper in NURPS, and I want to discuss a little bit about that. And I also want to show how it doesn't work at the end. So maybe we can actually uh, put our minds together to solve it. So this is the normal output of a binary classifier. We have you know, A class, a positive class. Towards left, we have lower probability. So for these samples that are shown with these markers, the model will say, if I have a threshold here, I will say these models, these samples are not from that critical class, while these samples have a higher probability of being on the critical class. So I can actually put the output of a binary classifier on one axis, right? And in these blue markers, I show you patients um, who truly need a DCE. Yeah, sorry for the autocorrect. And, um, and, um, and the red ones are the patients who truly need a dynamic contrast enhanced images. So actually, if I, had, if I were looking at a case, for example, a high sensitivity operating point, I would put the threshold here, not here. Okay. Now, how do we actually train this? How do we actually evaluate this model? We evaluate it using this ROC curve, no? True positives, false positives. And in this case, with this setup, this is the ROC curve. So in yellow, what I show you um, are the blocks that remain under the ROC curve and white are the ones that remain above the ROC curve. So AUC would actually correspond to the sum of these yellow blocks. Now I can actually train my model, fit in my weights, and for instance, let's say that I changed the order of these two samples for the better, right? So the red sample now has a higher probability than the blue sample. That sounds like a success. And this change reflects to my ROC curve as well. I basically added this blue block into my ROC curve. My AUC increase, I'm happy. But what you realize is actually the operating point, well, nothing really changed there. Instead, you could actually change swap these two guys. Now notice what happened. Again, I swapped these two guys by fiddling my weights further. The addition of this is now this blue block in my ROC curve. The AUC change is exactly the same. Nothing really changed, but my, my operating point got better. At the highest sensitivity, I have lower number of false positives. And you can see it in this plot as well. If I now have the threshold here at the very last red marker, I have fewer false positives. And we said, okay, hey, that's the intuition. How can we do it mathematically? And it ends up actually, you can divide your samples into two parts, the positive samples and negative samples, and write down a constraint optimization problem that is particularly asymmetric. Asymmetric meaning that the constraint is defined for all positive samples and asking all these positive samples to be far away from negative samples as much as possible. Now, you see actually the asymmetry. I'm actually summing through all the negative samples, but I define a different Lagrange multiplier effectively, or I define a different constraint for each positive sample. And this asymmetry is key for actually pushing all the positive samples from away from the old negative samples and actually preferring the green box over the red box. So effectively really making the model more useful at the realistic operating point. So we did this test with the MR imaging that I showed you. We had some other tests with the CIFAR, but I think they're kind of toy examples, nice to get papers in these generic conferences, but they're not the realistic examples. The realistic examples would be with the MR images. So we had 100 test samples, which 33 positive, meaning that 33 cases really truly need the DCE, and then 67 didn't need the DCE. What I show you is actually two results. I show you the number of false positives, um, or the false positive rates, I'm sorry, at either zero false negative or one false negative. So huge, um, huge sensitive models. And I show you three um, quite successful cost functions. So BC, you know, um, margin loss, focal loss. Um, we've also tried the asymmetric ones, so similar results were there. And what we've seen is actually with the zero false negative, we have a drop if we add the constraint I mentioned to the cost functions that I that, that are written here, we can actually drop the number of false positives quite a bit for the zero false negative model. 
But for the one false negative mole, the drop is even worse, even better. So with a simple constraint, nothing really changes in your model. The training time is roughly a little bit longer, but not that much. You start having a more realistic model that's actually ends up being useful. But that said, still the, the false positive numbers are huge. If we show this to, to the clinicians, they say, hey, great first work, now improve it further. Because uh, effectively, these are still high false positive numbers, they're not low. Um, so that's pretty much it. I want to thank people um, who I work with and think about these problems quite a bit. So Sarah, Nirav, Artunj, and Krishna, and the funding sources that actually put money for these works. And I want to um, you know, invite you all to Medical Imaging with Deep Learning Conference that we're going to hold in three weeks, I guess. Um, you can still register. It's a hybrid conference, so there will be an on-site and online part of it. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can either ask now or send me an email. Thank you very much. <laughs>